So thanks for joining us today in our, our webinar. So a new way to explore your Kubernetes storage options and introducing Kubester, which is an open source project. So before we get into it, I'm Michael Cade. I'm a senior technologist at Caston by Veeam. And I focus on community about delivering all of the good, good news that we do from a product point of view, but also content um, around what it is we're doing in that space. Suresh? Um, yeah. Um, hi, I'm Sharish. Um, I've been with Kasten for a little over a year now, and um, yeah, I'm excited to be here and tell That's you guys tough. a little bit more about Cubester. Cool. So, so to get get started, so this isn't our uh, first rodeo from a, an open source perspective. So we've had quite a an ongoing open source strategy as it as it comes down from a Kasten point of view. Um, Obviously, there's a there's a big why out there around open source at the moment about um, being able to leverage and help help the community. A huge history behind open source that goes way back. But just to go point into some of the areas that that we've focused in or, or contributed or leveraged and innovated on is the first one is that we want to mention is around Canister. So this is an open source framework that allows for application level data management or application level consistency when you're backing up your Kubernetes environments. And then you've got Copia, which is the underlying framework that allows you to really lift and shift data from, from A to B in terms of um, data protection, data management. And then what we're going to talk about today is Kubester. So we'll get into a bit of the challenges around why, why Kubester is a, is a thing, but also get into what, what Kubester is as well. So some of the challenges around persistent storage, as we know, persistent storage is growing quite quite dramatically, quite fast in, in the ecosystem. So when it comes to having multiple choices and, and uh, flexibility and where and what um, where you store that that application or that stateful data that you require, it's about we need to make sure that we're choosing the right storage. We need to make sure that the storage is fast enough for the, the application and the workload that we're leveraging that storage for we need to make sure that we're using the right storage like it's very easy to go and buy the fastest compute the fastest storage and yeah it'll probably do be great for your application but is it needed and obviously with that that higher spec comes a, a requirement around um, cost it's going to cost you more money and then another thing to consider is around is the storage ready for data protection like can it is is a snapshots capable are you able to do that lift and shift of data so that you've got a point in time copy of that data so if you were to need it you can recover back into that into that production storage or potentially into a another area and we always talk um generally about you can't always have the best the cheapest um and the, yeah the most um economic way of being able to it's just not you can't complete the three the three points of the triangle around having all three of the the best options so um there's always a financial constraint into that as we just mentioned around over provisioning and having more more storage than than you can use but you're still going to be paying for that or whether there's technical constraints on that um from a performance point of view so then yeah, that I leads think, us on um, to I, I think it really comes down to that there's a lot of a lot of choice and um, yeah, it's really hard to maybe prove which choice is best um, at the moment. Yeah, and, and we're gonna see more of that as we go through, right? In that we're yep. gonna, gonna touch on, well, why, why and how are, are those choices even blowing up even more? Yep. So one of the things that is a, is a challenge today is around understanding and benchmarking that storage rather than just going I'm going to start provisioning my um, my nodes, my um, my storage. How how can we make sure that our our storage is up to up to speed, up to scratch, up to performance mm -hmm. of what we need for that for that user, right? Um, and this isn't a new concept at all. Um, we've been doing this since the the 1950s when disk drives were first um, that well they first came to market and understanding the IOPS and the requirements around that. It's just in a Kubernetes world, I'm not going to say it's, I, I think it's difficult, but it's not as easy to, 
to be able to. Well, the thing is that Kubernetes is like a recent, it's, it's pretty re recent and young, and there's a lot of people that are trying to now enter the Kubernetes space and, you know, to just get on the ground running can sometimes be a little difficult, especially if you want to do something like, um, you have an application that's running, you know, on some legacy infrastructure and trying to move this application to Kubernetes. You may not know Kubernetes well, but you know your application's needs up front, right? Because this is what you already use this application for. So you know your application's needs. How can you prove that Kubernetes can satisfy those needs without that in-depth experience that you may have after using Kubernetes for like a few months or a year or whatever, it's, right? So, so yeah, yeah I, think I think it's it's a little bit of a challenge because a new space. But yeah, go ahead. No, so I was going to exactly back you, back you up on that, Sarish, is that not everyone's an expert in everything already yeah. today from a Kubernetes point of view. Things are changing very fast. They're, they're moving. People are actively having to, to get applications up and running. And sometimes they're just hitting the easy button on whatever storage is available to them and not necessarily thinking about the, the consequences of that from a financial point of view, but, not, but also from a performance point of view. Yep. And I think, yeah, so there, there is a need to have something that, you know, gives you that information, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And this just goes to cement that, right? In that mm -hmm. from an entry point of view and an ever-growing landscape of CSI drivers out there, this, this, uh, this was a recent snapshot that we took of the, the CNCF landscape. You can see on there, that there are X amount of, of vendors. But if you were to take a snapshot of this six months ago, it was probably half this. And that, that mm -hmm. goes to show some of the, the enhancements and the innovations that are happening around storage in a Kubernetes um, environment or in, as an option to, to Kubernetes clusters. Yep. Um, and like, like you said, like in the past, you know, it was just these, the entry, entry provisioners which were like baked into Kubernetes. Um, and then, yeah, with uh, I think there's there's flex volume that came in in between, and then with the introduction of CSI. Now, almost like anybody can write their own storage driver um, for Kubernetes. So, like I said, with with incoming CSI, I think um, the whole the number of options has blown up a lot for Kubernetes for, for, for storage in Kubernetes. Which, which is an awesome thing, right? It's great. You've got. So many options and the flexibility of being able to choose the correct storage that you need for your applications yep but it's not always a one size fits all so you need mm -hmm. to have the ability to choose the right storage and have that visibility and understanding of that of that storage yep so then we get on to well so like like Sarish said is that so we know our users we know our load we know what that looks like. We know what our application looks like. But then we've got all of these different choices, not to mention all of the other choices that you have in a Kubernetes world. But let's just focus on the on the storage and make sure that we're using the right data store. And this is where Kubester can, can really help there before we get into it. But the challenge is, is that you don't know what you don't know, right? In that by being able to run samples against those storage types potentially different storage types different storage protocols that all have different drivers and and different um capabilities is now you can understand a lot more about whether your application fits on that storage from a performance point of view but also does it tick all the other boxes around does it enable us to do data protection against that does it allow us to do this that and the other like they're all all common things that maybe you're being or, or not being looked at because people are just diving straight in to using what's available to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like it's, I mean, like you kind of said that um, applications can be very different and then workloads because the applications have, you know, that like um, applications can have need to be able to scale with the number of users you have, right? And the more users you have, now again, that's another another point of, of change. Another Another thing that, can change your IO output, right? And that's another thing you need to track or be able to test your storage if your storage is capable of handling growth and stuff like that, yeah. Yeah, and then just to simulate is that, well, all of those different applications, the databases, NoSQL, SQL, et cetera, but all other requirements around storage, there's potentially similar depending on what the load looks like, but 
There's also a lot of difference in there as well across different applications that require different storage needs and requirements. Yeah, uh, yeah, like like you said, it comes down to different application types, and then like uh, sorry, uh, different application types, and then like yeah, different types of users or, or different user profiles or different numbers of users, even right? Yeah. Yeah. So then this leads us on to well, how do we help? How how can we help? understand that storage or explore those options that you have from a storage point of view and there's three key parts that we'll we'll touch on we'll go a little bit deeper into about mm -hmm. how and then we'll get to show you as well on on what this looks like so the three key areas is well let's identify what options we have from a storage perspective within our existing kubernetes clusters let's validate that they tick the boxes that we require around snapshots but also other other areas and then let's evaluate that. Let's put some benchmarking around that and understand what the capabilities are of that storage in terms of performance and, and I.O. Mm -hmm. So getting into that, like let's say you've got various storage options. Let's say that you are one of those users, companies, businesses that have gone all in on Kubernetes. You've deployed everything. Your applications are running. Let's just say that like the storage was chosen and it's working great for you, but you just don't understand maybe what's what's happening under the under the hood, or whether you're using the complete um, all of the capabilities that you have available to you on the storage, like i.e. performance. And that's important here because this isn't just a day zero tool. This doesn't just it's not just applicable to people that are only deploying Kubernetes clusters today. You can go back and retro scan or identify the storage options that you have within your cluster, understand that performance that's available, but also discover wasted resources in there. So really give you a, a good visibility of what's going on in my Kubernetes storage landscape. Mm -hmm. So then we get into actually validating that the storage options that we have are in fact co configured correctly. So making sure that the storage options are configured correctly, but also is the storage capable of snapshots, say data protection, for example. And that's done, and I, in fact, I'll let probably Sarish talk about the flow here, about how this is this is an automated flow, right? And, and I know, Sarish, you're probably gonna show this in the demo later, but just as a visual, just walk us through that, that bottom bit, if you could. Yeah, um, so, you know, the first thing that comes down to is deploying an application, right? And um, generally an application is a pod, um, which maybe has some some data, some, some sort of storage or some sort of data. And that's represented by a PVC and a PV, right? So in this case, when we deploy something like what you see down here, um, it's just an application with some volume, with the volume attached to it, right? Um, yeah. Now, so this is something that, you know, like I said, if you have experience with Kubernetes, it's very straightforward. You already understand it, right? And then you also want to be able to validate, hey, can is my storage provisioner capable of now protecting this, right? So, so I definitely, uh, so I have a, um, so Kubester has a method here, which it'll deploy an application. It'll take a snapshot of that application and then restore it and ensures that the data that uh, was written to it originally exists there. She just kind of validate that, hey, yeah, my provisioner is now capable of, doing end-to-end -end, um, a data protection, right? Um, and I, the reason this kind of came about is because we definitely saw a number of customers uh, come, come to us and say that, hey, um, Kasson can't protect my thing because my snapshots don't work. And so a tool like this is very useful in like figuring out what the issues are in their uh, provisioner setup, right? Or in their storage setup. Um, and yeah, so uh, I think it's powerful in debugging the kind of issues that you might face when setting up a certain type of storage. So I think another thing to have, add here, and for those that are already obviously familiar with deployments, pods, PVCs, and PVs, then this will, this will all make sense anyway. But for those new to this space, is that this is, you run a command, and again, Suresh will probably show you this in the demo, is that this is as simple as you, you literally throw a command in and it will go away and it will run that that, that automated test against that, that PV basically and make that snapshot, perform that restore 
and then report back to say whether it was successful or not and automate that process. So whereas prior, the, the way in which that, that benchmarking or, or the validation would have to happen, more, more so the validation on this step, is you would have to go and create that, that application, that pod. You would have to create that PVC. You would have to create that PV. And all of create those that steps. that snapshot. Yep. Yeah. And it, and it became, and especially if you're, if you're new to the space, you're already being filled with other parts of the Kubernetes landscape and world. You probably haven't got even time to delve into the storage, the networking, everything around that to be able to understand how to do this. Even more so, if you've come from an operations point of view, the frustration of, like you, you like like me before, I, I was very much a storage person, so I was able. I'm I always lived in that world, but coming into here, it's like that's a that's a completely different way of thinking on how you would run those validation tests against your against your cluster. So th this is really just simplifying that validation of your of your storage options. And honestly, even if you're experienced, like sometimes um, it's good to just have a shortcut that can help validate your storage, right? Like it takes time to do all those things, to create a, uh, an application, then to create a snapshot and then to create, do a restore. Like all those steps are individual steps, but when you have an app, some sort of command that can do it quickly, it's, it's very helpful. And I mean, it's part of my toolbox on day-to-day -day testing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um and then we get to the final, the the final bubble or the final third like headline, if you like, and that's around evaluation. So how do we understand the performance that you can have out of your storage? Now this is leveraging, and I'm going to let Sharish get into the into the the uh, the details of this. But we're basically using FIO or flexible I/O tester to perform this test. So think about that pod deployment that we just spoke about the application. That's going to be FIO on a lightweight OS. It's going to simulate a given workload, and out of the box, there is a there is a set one that we that is available. But really, another piece here is that it can be you can plug Whatever in your you your own FIO configuration files. Um, in a true Kubernetes world, it's multi-platform. It doesn't really matter as long as you've got access to kubectl, then you've got access to be able to run. Um, Cubester alongside that. So it will pick up your storage that you have. And as as Sarish also ended the last slide on was, was that handy little tool in general, not only just for evaluation, but it's a handy little tool to have in your back pocket to be able to like identify, validate, and evaluate that the, the storage in your environment is up to speed for whatever requirements you have. And in particular here, is it's going to enable that that benchmarking, but also make it super easy and automated for that. And I guess, Sarish, what would you say about the bottom bit? That is there um, again, it's a, a lot like the previous slide. Like you deploy an application, like it's just something that you know, it's the core of Kubernetes, right? You deploy an application with some storage, and in this case, the application itself is something that tests I/O, right? Um, and yeah, I mean, like I said. All of this can be done manually, but we just automated the process, right? We've given you um, this application that has FIO that connects to a PV that runs this test and then reports results back. And um, this tool kind of helps you do that with like one step, right? Um, also, it's a very flexible tool. I made it so that you can provide your own FIO configuration. If you understand um, the type of FIO, or the type of IO that your application generates, then you know it's as simple as you know providing that FIO config to this um, function, and then it just prints out the results that you know will help you then decide: hey, is the storage good for me or bad for me? All right. Yeah, super. And again, that handy little tool to have in your back pocket just to have have that ability to understand what that storage is doing, but also think about this as a troubleshooting tool as well, because yep. storage also changes. Um, like wherever that may be, there could be other impacts on that storage environment. So having this there can pinpoint where that where that potential issue could be. So with that, um, Sarish, why don't we uh, why don't we jump into a bit of a demo and show show everyone how how this looks, how it works? Sure. Um, yeah, I can share my screen. Um, so yeah, I'll just uh, kind of run through. Uh, so I have a. Uh, uh, cluster here. It's a it's a 
GKE cluster. Um, and let's just do a get storage classes here. So, so you know, this is what you'd generally do if you wanted to see the, the storage options a lot uh, that are available in your cluster, right? Um, and it looks like here we definitely have uh, three different types of storage classes, but also, you know, it gives you some other information about the type of provisioner that you have. Now, this is useful for most, most cases, but sometimes you want to know a little bit more, right? Um, so that's why, you know, if you run something like Kubester uh, by itself against a simple program, um, it gives you some additional information. Um, for one, you know, some important information, like what kind of, what version of Kubernetes am I running, right? Um, but also now, you know, the same two provisioners that we saw, it breaks them down by provisioner and it gives you additional details about it, like, uh, you know, the type of provisioner, where you can find more information about it, and then, you know, some features that it supports, right? Uh, apart from that, it also does things like mentioned list of storage classes. Like if you, if you remember, those are the same two storage classes that we saw up here. Um, but additionally, it also tells you the type of volume snapshot class that they have in the case of a CSI driver, which, which this guy is, right? Um, and, and then, yeah, you know, this is an entry driver and an entry driver doesn't have a volume snapshot class, but it does still give you a little bit of information about it. Um, so that's, that's the base test. Um, the next test that, you know, we said we would want to show is the ability to take a snapshot and then restore it, right? So I will run that test right now. Let's, um, let's pick the premium storage class here and then, um, let's, uh, you know, there's only one volume snapshot class for us to deal with. So let's just pick that one. Um, so like, uh, like the previous slide said, what this is doing first is it's creating an application. And what an application has is um, a pod, a PVC and a PV. And in this case, the application itself is writing some data to this, to this PV, to this volume, right? Uh, it's probably writing like a date string or something like that, uh, something to identify some bit of, of data. Um, and once that application is, is up and ready, um, so you said it created a pod and a PVC, then we take a snapshot. Um, this will take a few, few seconds. But yeah, I mean, the point of this is to essentially validate that the snapshot functionality of your provisioner um, works, right? So yeah, it looks like we've taken a snapshot and now we're storing the application. And uh, once the application is restored, then we will um, validate that the data inside of it matches what we wrote initially. And then and that's success for us. I'll tell you that, hey, your, your storage is set up properly. And another couple seconds, maybe. Um, Suresh, what would that look like if you were like manually wanting to check that? So um, first you would have some sort of a deployment, right? Or an application, right? So you'd set up a pod. So you need to have maybe a YAML representation for this, right? So you have a YAML representation for a pod, a YAML representation for a PVC, and, that, and those two together will create your application, right? Um, so after that, then um, again, you'd have to create a YAML representation of, or, or some sort of, of, of a snapshot, right? And what that snapshot uh, YAML looks like is it says, hey, what is the uh, PVC that I'm trying to snapshot? Um, what is the snapshot class that I wanna use, right? And um, so I think that's like the base information that you need and you use that information and then you create that, that YAML and then what that'll do is it'll take a snapshot, right? And what you will see is you'll see a, a volume snapshot object being generated, right? Um, once you have that volume snapshot object, now you can create another YAML called a restore YAML, right? And that restore YAML will now need this volume snapshot object, right? Or, or sorry, well, so this restore YAML, YAML will look a lot like another pod in a PVC, right? And instead of the, in the PVC section, it says, hey, I want you to create this application using this existing snapshot, right? 
And then it'll take that existing snapshot, create this PVC with the old data, and then bring up your application. And so that's what a restore looks like. So, I mean, it's definitely like three or four different steps, but this gives you like a quick and easy way to just validate that uh, that entire workflow is successful, right? With just one command, right? That's the, just and that, I think that's the, that's the key part to this is that it's just taking away another potential pain point of having to run this. And I know the next, the next demo gets into, into the, the performance, the benchmarking of it, but a very similar flow, right? It's very similar. Um, it, so here we could run an FIO test. I have seen, uh, so let's use standard for this guy. Um, so this is, you know, the standard FIO test. I could just do a help here and just give you some idea of the options. Um, like I said, you could pass in an FIO config file. Um, you could also um, change the size of your storage. And you'll notice that for several of the uh, storage providers that the size does matter. Sometimes the bigger the size that you use of a volume, the faster your FIO result, FIO performs, right? Um, so yeah, there's a couple different things that you can modify here. Um, but yeah, let's run this with the defaults for now, um, just to see what we get. Um, in my experience, uh, well, okay, like I said, first, first thing we do is create a PVC. Um, and then we also create a pod. Which, which then completes our whole application, right? So that's, so that's an application which is now has FIO on it attached to a volume. Um, and it looks like it's taking some time because it's a hundred gig PVC. But yeah, create a pod. And now it's running an FIO test. This is a default FIO test that we have. And our default test is actually a set of four jobs. Um, it's random writes and reads on 4K and then 128K. Um, so, um, in my experience, it's taken about a minute and like 20 seconds or so, but, um, but yeah, what it's doing is it's, like I said, again, uh, a pod that has FIO as the application and it's running FIO against this PVC that's mounted somewhere. Um, now in terms of what it would take to do this on your own, um, yeah, you, you would get a pod which has FIO as the the application that, that's installed on it. Um, you could create this application using a pod and a PVC. And once you have that application there, then you could exec into this pod and then run an FIO test within the pod itself. But again, that's a couple extra steps, right? Um, a couple extra steps that maybe if you're new to Kubernetes, you may not want to, want to take those steps. Maybe you may just want to say, hey, can I run a some simple program and figure out whether this is right, right that this storage is right for me or not, right? Um, like I said, it's a it's a handy tool, um, something that you know would maybe useful in your toolbox as well. Yeah. So so one of the things just before you kicked it off, Sarish, was around the like different different size, like the the options around mm -hmm. uh, the size string, right? Um, yeah. And and this allows us to test against that. But if you notice that. Right at the beginning of the session, we also touched on what the compute node looks like or what the what the worker nodes look like and being able to choose them because that, especially in the public cloud, that dictates potentially what the storage can do and where there's a potential ceiling on on the disk underneath, right? So of course being able to run this, it gives you that that visibility of that and understanding of that. So it might mean that to get more throughput, more IOPS, you need to move up another compute node or a um, a compute type to be able to get better, to, to be able to get better performance. Better results, 100%. And um, I've actually written a blog post about this where we kind of talk about the, ver the various different ways that um, you can configure your entire Kubernetes um, environment to get the most out of your storage, right? There's, it's not just those two, there's multiple other ways too, like the types of nodes even matter, not just um, their size, but if the nodes themselves are shared versus dedicated, like that's a big that has an impact too on your on your performance, right? Um, yeah, I think we'll we'll share that down the line. But um, yeah, that that blog kind of covers a little, little bit more on all those op different options. Um, but yeah, you see here the different results. Uh, like I said, uh, four different jobs that ran. Um, 
and it gives you some some information. Now, like I said, this information can be output as um, as a JSON output, so that way you can maybe parse it better and uh, create your own reporting tools around that. Um, but yeah, uh, this is this is just what I output for now for this one test with with four different jobs. Um, but yeah, um, I think with that, uh, I'll give it back to you, Michael. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But nice, quick, easy, simple way of being able to check your storage, right? So yep. whilst I bring back the slides, and this kind of goes back to where where we were before in that mm -hmm. choosing your cloud storage and understanding your storage and the the options when you get into especially the public cloud is you've got different compute platforms you've got optimized compute in some areas you've got memory optimized compute which all play a part in what the storage does gpu options etc and then you've got potentially a premium or a standard or a high or and a standard a managed or managed that and depending on what the cloud provider you're you're in and you're using you've just you've potentially just walked into a huge minefield of having to understand what, what this all needs to look like. So you need to pick what the, the right type of storage, whether it's SSD, whether it's hard disk, whether in mm -hmm. some cases, whether the volume makes a difference, like we just mentioned. Other thing to keep in mind, the nodes that drive the IO, they also affect what that storage ceiling looks like, um, whether they're shared or whether they're dedicated, like I mentioned around whether they're premium or standard. And, for, for reference, we're using Azure here, but literally every cloud is is has their own options, which is great because we've got the flexibility and choice, but also it's a headache, especially when you're trying to get the right storage and you're trying to get the right compute and you're trying then also to make sure that your application has got the has got the correct or the correct configuration as well. There's a lot of things that are happening and you just kind of want to hit the easy button when it comes to, or at least try and hit the easy button when it comes to storage. Yeah, I mean, at least when it's trying, it comes to figuring out storage, maybe we're hoping that Kubester will help, will help you reach that goal of boiling down all these options into one that works for you. Yeah, exactly that. So I guess with that, that's a really good good point. So he says, well, how do you yeah. get started? Where, where can we find Kubester? Well, so you've got two QR codes and we'll make sure that there's links in the description and everything that, that enable you to get to here. But ultimately, it's kubester.io is the first and foremost, uh, probably the best place. But then the code repository is, is over on GitHub. Um, and you see some of the options that, that Sarish went through over on the left-hand side of the... This is all also found on the, on the site, on kubester.io. Is there anything you want to add there, Sarish? uh no i'm yeah i mean feel free to you know check it out um yeah i hope it's useful yeah i think i think i think like i was even able to to get things up and running in my home lab so it's super easy to get going if you're familiar with kubernetes this is going to be a walk in the park if you're just getting started it's really not going to be difficult to get going um at all yeah i think uh the biggest thing is that yeah if you if you have kubernetes set up um, and you've used kube cuddle at all, uh, kube control, um, then then you sh you have enough tools in your box to I mean or you have you have enough to get started. Let's put it that way. Um, that's all you really need to know. So then that brings us on to like getting to the end of the session. So how does the 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 goals of the project and this probably comes better from you, Sharish, but I'll I'll walk through them and you add anything sure. that you that you want to add. So first of all you've probably by now realized that how does this project help make benchmarking and validating your storage easy? Hopefully from the demo, from walking through the slides, you can see that there's a there's a passion there and a, the easy button to make that happen. We've mentioned a few times about a handy set of tools to debug and validate your storage. And also, obviously this is open. So in the future, we're there's plans to allow users to post their results, compare them to ultimately make it, make that easy button even easier because if someone else has already ran something against something and you've already got the specs of the workload that is required, then that'd be pretty awesome if we could just go and reference something to understand what that needs to look like. 
rather than having to all go and fish at the same time to see what it looks like on a, a paid for environment let's mm-hmm. just look at the let's look at the stats that have already already been done by the community so that we can help each other make the best decision when it comes to the storage options as well yeah um yeah that's kind of uh yeah that's one of the plans for the future right to to get the community involved to get uh more results and to kind of have yeah like i said you don't want two people fishing for the same thing instead somebody's already done it and you kind of have an idea of of how your application or what your application needs are then it'd be nice to have a place where you can go and say yeah these are my different options and this is how my application would fare in different environments right and what would be really cool is like storage vendors who are already very much embracing the CSI drivers for themselves, like leveraging that that driver. Mm-hmm. If they were able to run them same tests and cloud providers with their storage options, and we start to get build up a uh, build up a, a good list of options, storage options out there. I think that'd be a an awesome way to. To develop this and, and increase that that community footprint. Uh, and another thing you mentioned is uh, that the storage providers themselves, um, like I said, maybe the test that I ran isn't optimized for Google, right? Maybe Google has their own set of tests that are that they deem that that, that their storage runs the best on in, in those in those given parameters, right? Um, so yeah, it would be nice to kind of see if you know. To get that information as well, like their their FIO test, what did they pr- recommend? What kind of applications do they recommend? Right. So those are the kind of things that I could definitely imagine FIO, you know, capturing. Right. Saying that if you're using Google, you you know your application m- might work better if it looked like X Y Z or something like that. Right. Yeah, I, I, that's a that's an awesome point. Uh, FIO is just what what's been used here to to gauge that performance. But that application, in theory, could be like bring your own application that enables you to do something, right? Like yep. that's that's the beauty of this. Mm-hmm. So I think to to wrap things up is we've already seen these three things. So identify, let's understand and those various storage options that we have present in the cluster, whether it's day zero or whether it's like maybe you've got a Kubernetes cluster that's been going for weeks, months, years you can still use this tool there and help you identify potential um, areas with your, with your storage. And then validate is, well, let's, let's make sure that the storage is actually configured correctly, whether the snapshots are enabled, whether we can do something with that storage and just basically the options that we have available to our cluster. And then finally is around that evaluation, understanding what the storage performance can look like by running it against tools like FIO out of the box. Is there anything yeah. you want to add there, Sarish? No, it looks good. Uh, I think, um, yeah, it'll help you do all of these things, right? And I think down the, down the road, um, as we get more community involvement, I'd like to see what other, what else I can support, right? What else I can, how else can we grow Kubester to satisfy all your Kubernetes uh, storage needs, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think I'm excited to see how this can grow, how it can help achieve more around the the kubernetes storage space yep and how it can really you know help newcomers into the space get the, get running uh, get their feet on the ground cool okay so with that thank you for again watching the webinar um hopefully we've left all of the the relevant places that you need to to visit to find out more or see more kubester.io is probably the the first port to to uh to navigate to um but yeah hopefully that was useful thanks a lot yep thank you